Hey guys, Mr. Backberg here. Lesson 2.5 is all about finding zeros of polynomial functions. So our two objectives, number one, we are going to find rational zeros of polynomial functions. And then number two, we're gonna find conjugate pairs of complex zeros. And then we'll actually do something else with those zeros at the very end. Now, in math, when we're solving equations or functions, there's this thing called the linear factorization theorem. It says if a polynomial has a degree of n, so a highest power of n, then it's going to have exactly n linear factors and n zeros. So if we were given a linear function, it's obviously got one linear factor itself, so we could just set that thing equal to zero and solve. Quadratic, since the highest power is two, it's gonna have two linear factors, and then we would set each one of those equal to zero to find two zeros. Okay, so kind of following along those same lines, cubics are gonna have three zeros, quartic functions are gonna have four zeros, so on and so forth. Now solving might be kind of easy when we're looking at a linear function or if we're looking at a quadratic function. Once we get up to some of those bigger, more complicated functions, we have to use something called the rational zero test. So in order to find rational zeros, what we would do is we would first look at these p values, and it says that p is gonna be a factor of the constant term on the very end of our function over this q value, which is gonna be some factor of our leading coefficient. Now for the rational zero test, what it says to do is make a list of all of those p factors in the numerator of the fraction, make a list of all those q factors in the denominator of the function, and then we're gonna run some trial and error using synthetic division. Remember, if we get a zero remainder at the very end, that means yes, that thing is a factor. In this first example, what we're gonna do is we're just gonna list out all of the possible zeros. We're not gonna do the synthetic division to find the ones that actually work. So setting up our fraction on top, we look at those p values. Remember, those p values are the factors of our constant term on the end. We're looking at a three, and there's only a couple of options to multiply to three. It could be positive one and positive three, or it could be negative one and negative three. So the way we're gonna write that out is it could be plus or minus one and plus or minus three, because one times three is three, negative one times negative three, also three. For those q values on bottom, we wanna look at our leading coefficient, which in this case is a two. Again, only things that are gonna to multiply to two are one and two and negative one and negative two. So plus or minus one, plus or minus two. Now we do need to actually separate out all of these fractions. So if we take one divided by one, that is one, but again, because of these plus or minus signs in front of there, this could be a positive or a negative one. If we take one divided by two, well, that's a half, but again, with those plus or minus, it could be positive or negative. Three divided by one is three, again, positive or negative, and three divided by two is three halves, positive or negative. Okay, so there are eight possible zeros based on our linear factorization theorem. Since this is a cubic, only three of these things would actually work, but like I said earlier, we would have to run through and do that synthetic division to see which three actually do work. On this example, we actually are going to find the zeros of this function. So I'm gonna set up that rational zero test. Looking at those p-values, it's negative six. So things that multiply to negative six are like positive one and negative six, or negative one and positive six. So plus or minus one, plus or minus six. We could also use two and three. So plus or minus two and plus or minus three. On bottom, our leading coefficient is just one. So it's plus or minus one. Breaking up all of these individual fractions. Well, one divided by one is plus or minus one. Same thing with two, three, and six. Now, there are eight possible zeros. We have to run synthetic division to see which ones actually work. So remember, the way to see if these things are actually factors is we get a zero remainder at the end. We may or may not guess correctly right away. It's just trial and error from here. We try something out, maybe it works, maybe it doesn't. So I'm gonna use negative one. If we look at setting up our synthetic division, we need one, negative one, one, negative three, and negative six. Remember, for synthetic division, we carry down the first term, multiply and add multiply and add, multiply and add, and then multiply and add, we get a zero remainder. So yes, we just showed that negative one works. Okay, so that would mean that x plus one is a factor. So setting that thing equal to zero 
we get x equals negative 1. Okay, this number out in front actually does turn into the 0, so we could just say that right away negative 1 is a 0. Now, based on this, we can just set up another round of synthetic division underneath here. I'm going to use 2, carry down the first term, we get 1, 2 times 1 is 2, add these things up, we get 0, 2 times 0 is 0, add these things up, we get 3, 3 times 2 is 6, so we get a 0 remainder, so yes, 2 also works. Our leftover thing would be x squared plus 3. And if we were to set that equal to 0, that would give us some complex zeros. We'd get x squared equals negative 3. We would square root both sides to get x equals plus or minus i root 3. The problem just asked us for the real 0 answers. So we've got x equals negative 1 and x equals 2. There are some times where the rational 0 test might not be very handy. Like if we look at finding the real solutions of this negative 10x cubed plus 15x squared plus 16x minus 12, looking at those p-values, the factors of 12, well, 12 has a lot of factors. It could be plus or minus 1 and plus or minus 12, plus or minus 2 and plus or minus 6, plus or minus 3 and plus or minus 4. Looking at the factors of 10, we've got plus or minus 1 and plus or minus 10 plus or minus 2, and plus or minus 5. There would actually be 32 possible rational zeros. So if we tried to run through synthetic division to just pick out a few of these things, it's going to get messy, it's going to be really complicated, and it might take us a long time to find those things. So my suggestion is with something like this, where we have these big long lists of possible zeros, we're going to use our calculator to help us out. If we were to type this function into our calculator, we get a picture that looks something like this. I can see that my graph is crossing at the point 2, 0. So that means that 2 is a 0 of the function or is an x-intercept of the function. So I'm going to use that to help me out with my synthetic division. So setting up our synthetic division, we said we were going to use 2 because based on our graph, we saw that that one was going to work. We've got negative 10, 15, 16, and negative 12. So carry down the first term, negative 10, multiply, we get negative 20, add these up, that's negative 5, multiply, we get negative 10, add these up, that's 6, 6 times 2 is 12, there's our zero remainder. If we look at the leftover polynomial, that's negative 10x squared minus 5x plus 6, we could set this thing equal to zero. I don't think this is going to factor out, so we're going to have to run the quadratic formula with this. So negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4 times a times c all over 2a. Simplifying underneath the radical, negative 5 squared is 25. Negative 4 times negative 10 is 40. 40 times 6 is 240 all over negative 20. Combining things underneath the radical, we've got 5 plus or minus the square root of 265 all over negative 20. From here, I would probably punch this stuff into a calculator to get our final answers. If we take 5 plus the square root of 265 all divided by negative 20, we get about negative 1.06. If we take 5 minus the square root of 265 all divided by negative 20, we get about 0.56. So there's our three answers. We had two earlier from that synthetic division, and then negative 1.06 and 0.56. If when we're solving a function, we end up with a complex zero, one thing we're gonna notice is that those things show up in conjugate pairs. So if a plus bi is a zero of the function, that means automatically a minus bi has to be a zero as well. So we're going to use this fact in just a little bit to help us write out some actual functions based on zeros. So like I said, we're going to work backwards to find a polynomial function that would give us the zeros that we're looking at. So in this first example, we're told we've got zeros of 2 and 5i. On the last page, we said if a complex zero shows up, its conjugate pair also has to be part of the solution set. Now what we want to think about to write out the polynomials are the factors that would give us these zeros. In order to get a zero of two, we would need x minus two as a factor because then like we would set it equal to zero and add the two over, get x equals two. 
In order to get 5i, we would need x minus 5i. And in order to get negative 5i, we would need x plus 5i. Now what we're going to do is multiply this stuff together to get a big long polynomial. If we take x minus 5i times x plus 5i, we're going to get x squared plus 25. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to foil that out with the x minus 2. So x times x squared is x cubed. x times 25 is plus 25x. Negative 2 times x squared is negative 2x squared and negative 2 times 25 is negative 50. Now I am going to rearrange this in 2 power descending order. So x cubed minus 2x squared plus 25x minus 50. In our next example, we've got zeros at 3, negative 6i, and its conjugate pair, positive 6i. So the factors would be x minus 3, x plus 6i, and x minus 6i. Multiplying these last two things together, the x plus 6i and the x minus 6i, it's going to give us x squared plus 36. And foil that out with our x minus 3. x times x squared is x cubed. x times 36 is 36x. Negative 3 times x squared is negative 3x squared. And negative 3 times 36 is negative 108. Rearranging this into power descending order, we've got x cubed minus 3x squared plus 36x minus 108. You guys can just hang on to this last example for right now. We're going to run through that one in class together. So that's it as far as this video goes. Please remember to fill out the Google form linked in the description down below. And thanks for watching.